feel great and excited to just see everybody. It's just, it's just good. It's good to see everybody. So uh, we thank you for being here and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, but worship. And, and again, worship and is, uh, oh, you're just making sure the YouTube, YouTube's up. Okay. Uh, making sure our YouTube, thank you, Jared, making sure our YouTube stream is up. So we're very thankful that the McLaughlin's of Joe and C are going to be able to bless us this morning. So without further ado, let's go to the Lord. so glad, thankful that I got to come and be here today. It has not been my easiest week, for those that know. Um, and I woke up this morning and I, I barely slept at all. Probably got like two hours of sleep because um, I've been having trouble sleeping. And I woke up and I really did not want to come because I wanted to sleep. And I remember laying there and being like, well, my dad said he had backup songs, you know, just in case. And I thought, well, maybe I should just stay in bed. Maybe I should just stay here. And though I think sleep is important and sleep is good, I think it's also, I think it's also important to know that we have a victory already because of what Christ has done for us. So we have three songs for you. Um, they're called Defender, King of My Heart, and What a Friend We Have in Jesus, which I, I love that song. But Defender is, is all about how his way is, is above our ways. You know, his thoughts are not our thoughts. And I think sometimes we like to throw that on things and on car bumpers and on stickers, and but we don't realize just how above just how minute we are in the grand scheme of the universe and so his ways are not my ways and if it were up to me i probably wouldn't have allowed what he's allowed in my life but i'm thankful that i can trust him with that anyway and i'm thankful that he goes before us anyway so with all that being said we're gonna open today with defender better 
to find your truth. And mercy is the shade I'm living in. And you restore my faith and hope again. And what I did was praise. All I did was worship. the king of my heart be the mountain where i run the fountain i drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are the
the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song cause you are good Solace 
so good to be back live. I was telling coach the other day, you know, we were struggling with the ice and he goes, if you want to do it, I texted him back. I said, no, I, can't, I can't preach sitting down. I, I don't know how to sit at the, in, on the couch and zoom. And it's like Patsy always said that you, you can't preach without using your hands. And if you put your hands in your pocket, you wouldn't be able to say a word. I'm thinking how true that might be. And it, it is a privilege and an honor. I can remember a old preacher used to say, it's, it's always good to be behind God's holy desk, the pulpit. And, and I don't take it lightly when, you, when you're able to open God's word and you're able to be an ambassador for him and speak for him. It is such an honor and a privilege. I can't even describe that when I get up and people always say, what are the people's worst fears? You know, people used to say, speaking in public, well, I was never really, that never bothered me so much. But it was more when you're standing representing God, when you open up his word, is when I really make sure that I get it right, make sure it's accurate, make sure I've done my homework, make sure I'm prepared, make sure that you hear what God has to say. It's certainly, I'm not up here to, in any stretch of the imagination, give my own opinion. I'm here to open God's word and exegete what God has said, what God has said, because it does, you, you didn't come here to hear me. And God forbid, <laughs> a, a strong no from coach. And that's exactly right. And, and, uh, and that's exactly right, because my opinion means nothing. But because we have all have gifts that are to be used by our Lord to exercise for his glory. I just love to study God's word. I, I, I love it. I mean, he's given me that gift. So anyway, without further ado, behind God's holy desk, it's an honor and privilege to share and be back live and speak with my hands. Amen. <laughs> John MacArthur in his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, says this, and I quote, Herein lies the fallacy of today's popular approach to evangelism. The gospel appeal is tacked unto a wholly inadequate explanation of what it means to believe. The modern definition of faith eliminates repentance. It erases the moral significance of believing. It obviates the work of God in the sinner's heart. It makes an ongoing trust in the Lord optional. Far from championing the truth that human works have no place in salvation, modern easy believism has made faith itself a wholly human work. 
a fragile temporary attribute that may or may not endure, close quote. I agree with Dr. MacArthur on that. I believe what we have seen in evangelicalism over the, over the several decades has been just that, has distorted the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, has made it easy for people to sign a slip or to pray a prayer or to be baptized or to jo join a church and people think that they're in the club or people think that they're saved. And that's a tragedy, a false belief or a false sense of their salvation is critical because their eternity is at stake. You won't find it with this preacher. And it's, this message is not a popular message by no stretch of the imagination, but it doesn't have to be popular. It has to be truthful. I was at a class reunion. Of course, I'm up there in age. I graduated in 75, so for 40-some years. Anyway, and to see my old friends, it was, it was kind of cool. I was kind of looking forward to it. You know, I think people have mixed emotions about their high school reunions. You know, am, I, am I slim? Do I look old? And, and, you know, how well am I doing? What about my career? You know, and those type of things. And, and, but I just kind of want to have a sense of go see some old friends. And I can remember going, and it was an outdoor event. Sure enough, all of all my buddies were there, and we celebrated class 75, 76, 74, 75, 76, 77. We combined it all together. And several of my friends knew what I had been doing, meaning that I became a Christian. And they would say things like, we heard you became a preacher. And there were things like that, kind of tongue-in-cheek and that type of thing. And some were kind of mocking and some were ribbed and some were thought it was noble and different attitudes toward where I was at and what I've done since I had graduated because they knew who I, what I used to be like. I was like, we were in that world together. And so I sit with one particular gentleman and I started talking to him and I was sharing my testimony with him and he affirmed, yeah, he, I, yeah, I, I, everything he said, oh, yeah, amen. He was echoing Christian words to me back, and he said that he accepted a Christ as his Savior at a point in time, and he was in. He crossed the T's and dotted the I's, and I was, that's good. And I was thinking to myself, but, but everything that he said, and everything that he did, and everything that he was doing at the party, in the, in the language he used, and the habits he was doing were the same things we were doing in 1975. I didn't see any evidence. Now, granted, I wasn't the one to judge a heart and all that, but the Bible's pretty clear. But he had a false sense of security. He had a false sense that he was saved. He had a false sense he was a Christian, even though he could care less about the Bible, didn't go to church, wasn't in a fellowship, continued to be in sin. All these things were not conducive of a change life and so i just didn't say a whole lot but i say listen i pray for you but i went away thinking that's so common in today's christianity a lot of people think they're christians but they're not matthew chapter 7 was very clear at the end times many people will say lord lord didn't i do many things in your name didn't i do this and do that and the lord said depart from me i would never what i never knew you Depart from me, those who work iniquity or lawlessness. So we're continuing our series. It's entitled, The Genuine Gospel According to Jesus. And we've already discussed the sovereignty of God in salvation. And we looked extensively in Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 14. And we talked about the, how salvation in its entirety is all of God from beginning to end, from start to finish, from eternity past to eternity future. And from that text, we also dis discussed all the blessing that God grants us when he adopts us into his family, all the spiritual blessings from salvation to sanctification to glorification. He's promised those things. He's promised us the kingdom. And from that text, Last week, we also talked about genuine repentance. 
And we found that repentance is granted by God as well. It's not a human work. We saw that in Acts chapter 11, verse 18, in 2 Timothy 2. And we also discovered rightly, as, as Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones rightly said, he said, and we gave the definition of repentance, and this is very critical, because a repentance is really an ongoing lifestyle of the believer. Repentance never stops. It's just not a one-time act. As a matter of fact, we should repent more often as we are Christians because we hate sin. And listen again, and I said this last week, and I need repeating. And it's good to quote old preachers and some of those that passed away because they lived it. And Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones is a very trustworthy source because I've done my homework and checked him out, what he believes. And he says this about repentance. Repentance means that you realize that you are a guilty, vile sinner in the presence of God and that you deserve the wrath and punishment of God and that you are hell-bound. It means that you begin to realize that this thing called sin is in you and that you long to get rid of it and that you turn your back on it in every shape and form. You renounce the world, whatever the cost, the world in its mind and outlook as well as its practice. And you deny yourself and take up your cross and go after Jesus Christ, your nearest and dearest. And the whole world may call you a fool or say you have religious mania you may have to suffer financially, but it makes no difference. That's repentance. That's an amen because it's right. It's exactly what the Bible teaches about repentance. And when you become a Christian, repentance is ongoing. We talked about that a lot last week. Likewise, as we now talk about true faith, true faith is also a supernatural gift of God. True faith, believing faith, biblical faith. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, whatever form you have, whether it's digital, if it's hard copy, if it's memorized in your brains, if it's whatever, however, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. There's a text that's, text that's well known, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And I'll go through many scriptures today, so, you know, I pray that you can always listen to this later and take notes, if you will. But these are very important texts. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. We love to memorize these things, but what does it really mean? Do we trust the text? Do we trust what it says? Do we trust what, what, the, what Paul is saying through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about salvation? Do we, do we really get it? The gift of God is the entire process. Grace, faith, and salvation it is what Paul had in mind in keeping with this context. I believe that. And you go back a few verses in verses 4 and 5, Ephesians 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Even when we were spiritually dead, even when we were corpses, even when we were unable to respond, God woke us up from the spiritually dead. He breathed life into us. We were helpless until God intervened to give us life. So this faith, this believing faith, is an integral part of the gift His grace bestowed upon us. God graced us with His grace. I love that. God graced us with His grace. He woke us up to, uh, to be able to give us grace so that we may respond to His grace. That's amazing, isn't it? The Scriptures consistently teach that faith is not conjured up by the human will, but it is sovereignly granted it's a sovereignly granted gift by God. It has nothing to do with my humanness. Because I'm dead. I was dead. I couldn't respond to the things of God. Jesus is very clear. In the book of John, for example, most people love the book of John. It's a great place to learn about the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
about who he is, his response to the disciples, right? But most new Christians, people always say, read the book of John. I, I once challenged a guy in Daytona Beach Bike Week. He, he, he wanted to know who God was. I said, just read the book of John for a year and come back and find and, and he came back and he said, I can't escape one thing. He said that Jesus is God. I said, yes, that's John's intent to show that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was God, and it was life in his name. And his words are very powerful. It's Jesus' words that are powerful, and they're hard to grasp at times, but they're straight on. They're straight on. They're narrow. They're constricted. They're precise. They have a target. In John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus said this, that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Key word in that verse is draws. Draws. The Greek word for draw is elko, and it has the meaning to compel by irresistible superiority. Let me say that again. The word draws means to compel by irresistible superiority. The, gospel, the word means to compel. Not to woo, but to compel, to come to me. It's a summons. It's a summons. John 6, 65, same chapter, 20 verses over. Jesus, he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. Several words in this verse I'd like to point out. The first element we see in, here in John 6, 65 is a universal negative. Oh, I talk like a teacher, don't I? A universal negative. It's a universal negative. The words no one, the words no one are all inclusive. No one, okay? They allow for no exception apart from the exception Jesus adds. Make sense? Absolutely. The next word is very crucial. It is the word can. This has to do with ability, not permission. Let me see if we can get an illustration. Who's ever been corrected by a school teacher, for example? Okay. You raise your hand and you ask what? Can I sharpen my pencil? And maybe the teacher say, well, I believe that you can. Now, you may go do it. Can has the meaning of ability. May have carries the idea of permission. Think about these words now, okay? The word can, can. So what Jesus is not saying, what he's not saying in this verse, is that no one is allowed to come to me. He is saying no one is able to come to me. He is not able able to come to me. Hang on. The next word in the passage is also vital. Unless, unless refers to that we call a necessary condition. No one can come to me unless, which is a necessary condition, right? A necessary condition refers to something that must happen before something else can happen. Stay with me. The meaning of Jesus' word is very clear. No human being can possibly come to Christ unless something happens that makes it possible for him or her to come. And the necessary condition, Jesus declares, is that it has been, what? Granted him by the Father. Ah! Permission. Jesus is saying that the ability to come to him is a gift from God. Man does not have the ability in and of himself to come to Christ. God must do something first. Yes, the passage teaches at least this much. It is not within fallen man's natural ability to come to Christ on his own without some kind of divine assistance. Man is spiritually dead. He cannot respond. If you've, if you've ever tried to wake up a corpse 
and give him stimuli and poke and prod and, and electrocute and all. He doesn't do anything. D.L. Moody said the only thing a, a corpse can do is stink. That, that is where man is in his spiritual state before God draws him or grants him permission to respond. This is what Scripture teaches. Jesus' words are very clear. Acts chapter 3, verse 16. If you recall, Peter is preaching, right? Powerful sermon after Pentecost. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's preaching Christ and Christ crucified. He's been risen from the dead. He gives life to sinners, right? And, and verse 16 says, And on the basis of faith in His name, Him, Jesus, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man because he healed, he healed a man. If you go back to the first few verses, again, in context, he healed a man. Religious guys don't like that stuff. Jesus was doing those things, and his disciples were healing people, and they were walking and talking, and they could hear and they could see. He has strengthened this man whom you see and you know. They couldn't deny the miracles. They're right in front of him. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. This faith which comes through him was given him. No mistake, in Jesus' words we're talking about, it was a, it's a gift. His disciples, his apostles were saying it's a divine gift. His faith, grace, repentance, mercy, compassion is all a gift from God, the Father, who draws men to himself. And even Peter Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have what? Received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're a believer, you have the same faith as I have because I received it, it was given it to me. You have the same faith as Martin Luther. Billy Graham. You have the same faith as the Apostle Paul, as the Apostle Peter, because it's a gift that was given to you to wake you up and to respond and receive the gift of forgiveness, of salvation, of repentance, of faith. Faith, believing faith, is a gift from God. Well, how do we know that faith is God's gift? Because left to ourselves, no one would believe. Left to our own unredeemed humanness, no one would be able to be seeking God. It's very clear. Romans, the great doctrinal epistle by the Apostle Paul, what somebody once called the book of Romans the, the, the Christian's constitution. It's full of doctrinal truth. It's profound. It's profound. And the first three chapters of the book of Romans is God's indictment on man. It's like a courtroom scene. He's looking down out of heaven, and he's looking over mankind, and he's given the man his indictment. And in Romans 3, 10 through 12, it's very clear. And all these scriptures, by the way, were in the Old Testament. Paul's echoing them in the New, and he's saying, as it is written, well, look, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. He's saying these things. There is none righteous, not even what? None one. There's no, none right. There's no one who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have what? Turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. None. Nada. Yeah, hard. One or after another, right? You got to get it. And listen to this. And this is not my own, and I have to. I, I kind of took this from somebody, and, and again, I, I have to give Dr. MacArthur credit for this quote because I didn't want to. I want to mess it up. And he said this: God's grace cannot be faithfully preached to unbelievers until the law is preached, as man's corrupt nature is exposed. It is impossible for a person to fully realize his need for God's grace until he sees how terribly he has failed the standards of God's law. Man can't come to Christ until he understands he's a sinner, that he's rebelled, that he's in war and entity with his God, 
that he needs to make it right. And, and Romans said, there's no one righteous, no, not one, and you can't even get there. It buries the sinner. That's the intent of the law. It's our schoolmaster. It was designed for that purpose. The late Dr. Walter Martin used to say, and I can remember I him saying it, he would say things like, you know, well, if they don't, if, if sinners don't respond to God's grace, then give them Moses. And what he meant was give them the law. If you think you can stand before God by, by keeping the law of God, good luck. The self-righteous Pharisees thought they could in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus buried the self-righteous Pharisees, didn't he? Because he looked and he turned it inwardly. If you've even thought about committing adultery, you've done it already in your heart. If you've even thought about murder or killing or even to call somebody a fool, you've done it already in your heart. God looks at the internal. Man looks at the outside, while God looks at the heart. God judges eternally, internally. Romans 9 is very clear. The, the whole section of God choosing who he chooses for salvation, the debate is ongoing. God has to, def you know, Paul was trying to, to defend those Jews who are saying, God's not fair if he chooses some and passes over others. That's the whole argument of, of Romans 9. What shall we say then in verse 14 of Romans 9? There is no justice with God, is there? May it never be. That's absolutely not. It's a very strong answer. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It's God's prerogative. He owns everything and everybody. He created everything and everyone. He decides. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, verse 16, but on God who has mercy. People say, that's not fair. You always hear that. It's not fair. You don't want fairness. You want mercy. That's absolutely right. It's a pardon. It's compassion. It's mercy. People say, I just want justice. If you want justice, God has the right to send everyone to hell. There's no one right. No, not one. That's very clear in Scripture. To me, that brings a sinner as, thank you, Lord. Why me? I don't know why, because he loves me, compassionately chose me before the foundation of the world. He carved, he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is a very humbling, sober reality the Scripture teaches from the beginning to the end. God draws the sinner to Christ. And he gives the ability to believe. Without that divinely generated faith, one cannot even understand and approach the Savior. How often did I try to read the Bible on my own before I was saved and it meant nothing to me? I even tried to read it. This, it, it it's foolishness to man. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No, we love the Bible for good luck as good luck pieces. We'll, we'll take some car, we take some scriptures out. We love that and put it in your back pocket for good luck. And when times get tight, we pull one out and you know, the little, you know, put it on the. That's not the word of God. God draws the sinner, gives us the ability to believe. Because 1 Corinthians 2 14 is very clear. Paul makes this very clear. Because the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? They're foolishness to him. And he cannot understand it because they're spiritually appraised. Again, they're dead. We were dead. They can't understand the spiritual realm. They live in the natural. Man has free will, but can only go so far. You know, God has free will too. Who's superior over the other? You as parents, when you, know, you allowed your children to make choices all the time. But then, then you were free to make your choice once they made their choice. Your choice as a parent has superiority over the choice of the others. Yeah, man has free will choice up to a limited extent because of the fallen nature of man can only go so far. The one thing a fallen man can't do is choose God on his own until God intervenes. God has to initiate faith, believing faith, saving faith, true faith. That is precisely why when Peter affirmed his faith, remember the great confession 
in Christ as the Son of God. Remember in, in, in Matthew chapter 16, for example, he already confessed that you are the Messiah, you are, the, you are God. In Matthew 16, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because what? Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but who did? But my Father who is in heaven revealed to you that I am Christ, that I am the Messiah, that I am God. Same thing with you, same thing with you, same thing with you. Well, if you came to know Christ, God the Father revealed to you who Christ was. That's a gift. He bestowed upon you saving grace, compassion, mercy, repentance, the ability to believe. That's a gift. Faith is graciously given to believers by God himself. True saving faith. Faith is, a, is as a divine gift is neither transient or, nor impotent. It has an abiding quality that guarantees it will endure forever. That's why you cannot lose your salvation, because faith is of God, and God sustains those who he loves, and he's already written you in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you are already marked for glorification. If it had anything to do with the human will, then you would lose it. You would never get it to begin with, and I'm so I stumble and fall into sin that I'm not worthy of it. Exactly. Until a person understands that he or she's not worthy, that he's spiritually, that's why in Matthew 5 it says, blessed are the poor in spirit because I, I'm incapable of myself to do anything for God. I need him. I'm a sinner. I need grace. I need mercy versus the self-righteous. I'm glad I'm not like this guy. Jesus said, I tell you which one of those was truly repentant. It's pretty self-evident that the broken sinner who cried out for God for mercy is the one God accepted because even that was granted. Habakkuk said to four, but the righteous will live by faith. Ongoing, even in the Old Testament, the righteous live by faith. Faith was granted as a gift in the Old Testament. It was never by law. Abraham was saved by faith because he believed God and it was counted him as what? As righteousness. It went to his account, his judicial account. He's right with God because of his faith. The faith it was a gift. The faith it was granted. Not had anything that Abraham did. Abraham, Abraham sinned, right? Look at all those dudes in the Old Testament. Look at the dudes in the New Testament. Look at me. Look at you. Man, thank God for it is a gift. Man, thank God he woke us up. He breathed life into you so you can respond. There's a couple of verses that I don't have on the slides, but Hebrews 10.38 speaks of a, of a momentary act of believing. Not, excuse me, not, not as a momentary act of believing, but of a living and enduring trust in God. Faith is an ongoing living trust in my Savior. He sustains me. He gave me the, I can't lose it. He, he has me. I'm in his hand. What a friend we have in Jesus. Absolutely. He's my mediator. He's my intercessor. He stands before me and God as my advocate. Man, thank you, Jesus, right? That's why he's a friend. Hebrews 3.14 emphasizes the permanence of genuine faith. It's the very durability. It's proof of its reality. When we're going through what we go through, when we, 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 we don't waver, yeah, we we. We have trials, we have temptations, we have all the things, but it, those who are permanent are sustained through it. Hebrews 3.14, again, for we have become what? Partakers of Christ. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance until the firm the end, and we hold fast because he holds us fast. We are overcomers because he's an overcomer. It's not human works that keeps us in the, the body. It's divine intervention. In Philippians 1.6, Paul says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He who is in you will not let you go. He is continually conforming you to the image of his Son. That is his process in you, a progressive sanctification that is evidence that you are His. 
He is chopping off the areas that need to go away, and he's bringing it into conformity with his son that brings him glory. And the faith God graciously supply, supplies produces both the volition and the ability to comply with his sovereign will. It is a want to, not a get have to. It is I want to please my God now. He's done a work in me. I don't like sin. I fall into it sometimes, and I hate it when I do it. And I repent of it. I hate it, sin. I hate everything about it. I don't like any part of it. And any Christian who says he does not hate it, I question that they have saving faith. It's not for me to decide, but again, that's what the Scripture teaches. And I believe for Philippians 2.13, says, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And I'm not going to be able to finish this sermon today because there's too many. I've got another part. And because, because genuine faith, folks, carries the idea of obedience. And we're going to look at that next week. Faith doesn't stop there. Faith now has fruit attached to it. And it's about obeying my Lord and making Him, and He is Lord of my, of, of my life, and He's Lord of everything about me. He owns me. He owns you. He owns everything about you. He owns your destiny. He, owe, he owns your allegiance to Himself. And faith without works is dead. We're going to talk about that next week. Father, we thank you, Lord. I, this powerful message of saving faith is of all of you and none of us. We are responders to the life that was breathed into us as you woke up, just as you woke Lazarus from the dead and said, come forth. You summoned us out of the grave, and now we take off our grave clothes and we start living for you because you supernaturally imparted your life to us and you granted us faith, repentance. You granted us truth, compassion, mercy. You've given me all these things as a free gift. And now we are to walk in alignment with who you say we are. Yes, we have a new identity, but it's not man-centered. Thank you that we are still we are saved by grace through faith. And we are saints. We're called out ones. But as Charles Spurgeon said, we're also sinners at the same time. We still have that capacity. Don't let us ever forget the depravity of man and the sin nature that dangles around and that, and that, and that, that can, can trap us and can tempt us. All things. It's not who we are, but yet it lives. Yet it lives. But the true Christian, the true one who really wants to serve their king, obeys obeys and you give us the capacity to obey by your holy spirit thank you for that lord it's in jesus name i pray amen wow i i like that tease at the end carl oh, i can't finish this now next week i'm gonna go and that's very good very good marketing there very good marketing to make sure that we definitely want to be back uh, next week so which we do which we do i do have a little i can't talk a little bit about next week please please i beg every you i'm going to send uh, and anybody who's not here uh, who you know please check your email hopefully tomorrow hopefully tomorrow i will be sending an email out which will be very exciting we're hoping we, we i believe so but i i can't I can't, can't sign on the until I sign on the dotted line. I cannot say anything yet. So, so please, please pay attention. And also, I'd ask you to pray for a lot of meetings that I have with folks this week. I have one, two, three, four. I think I have four different meetings this week, and there are exciting, really, really exciting things. I don't, I'm not supposed to say things, possibilities that uh, the Lord seems that they, he is opening up to us. And uh, so also pay attention for another email, which 
if things happen, I'm going to ask, we're going to have, I, I think I got to stop here. So I, I, I'm, I'm promising Laura said, don't get ahead of yourself. So I'm not going to get ahead of myself. So again, th I'm so glad everybody was able to come today. And uh, the Simpsons, hello, hello, hello. And uh, just keep, just keep being who you are. You really, it's so important, just who you are through the workplace, who you communicate with day in, day out. There's just so many people who need to see people who really know Jesus, even through the trials and are willing to say, no, he is still good. Uh, and to have that, that truth. So we love you guys. I pray that it's not snow, ice, or whatever. We're able uh, to do stuff next week. So, all right. What is it? Again? Oh, at least thank you. We were able to come today. All right. All right. Love you guys. Peace. <laughs>